Welcome to The Author's Corner with H.D. Campbell. Each show will be filled with news, interviews, technology, and reviews all about you, the writer. And now here's our host, H.D. Campbell. Welcome back to another installment of The Author's Corner with H.D. Campbell. As always, I'm your host, H.D. Campbell. Today I'll bring you another special show where I will normally bring you three authors. I'm only going to interview one. Her name is Delia McCutcheon, a new soon-to-be author with a powerful story to tell. She's a survivor of abuse, and she is but the first in a series of specials I'm doing on authors who survive domestic violence. In fact, I'm declaring July Domestic Violence and Literacy Month. So without further ado, after this break, I will bring you the first installment of our interview with Delia McCutcheon. Love can be hard, but finding love can be like walking through miles of desert with a half a cup of water. Read one person's journey in How to Lose a Black Woman. Buy it on my website for only $5 during May and June at www.hdcampbell3.net. My Late Murder at 10. Ex-investigative reporter turned audio engineer Mark Alexander is brought back into the business when the top news anchor at the station he works is tragically shot by a masked gunman and the co-anchor is arrested for engineering the murder, but Mark Alexander smells a classic frame-up. Now he has to face old friends and confront his demons to get the truth uncovered, but as each controversy gets uncovered, each turn could be Mark's last. Buy Late Murder at 10 at your favorite bookstore or these websites. Welcome back to the Office Tunnel with A.C. Campbell. This is the first installment of my interviews with Daniel McCutcheon. I just say I've, I've interviewed a lot of strong women um, on this show, and I'm going to ask the same question I've asked of all of you. You're a model, you're a writer, you're a businesswoman, you're a mother. Um, you, you're going to be starting some other projects and venues. Uh, how in the world do you keep it all together? Question. I want to tell you, Sarah Lost, because you're a very beautiful woman. Thank you. 
So, uh, and if I had a magazine, you would model for me because then, <laughs> because you know, beauty. I mean, beauty shows all facets, and you are a very beautiful woman. Also, also too, you don't call yourself a bottle, but you bring a standard to it. I was reading one of your uh, bios in which you were putting out your resume as far as what you want, uh, where you want as far as people hiring you is concerned. You bring a big standard to to the modeling genre. I mean, what drives you to do that?
also a special shout out to, you know, Tequila uh, James of Fab Reality Radio because she was the one who started doing her t-shirts. And I was like, you know what, that is a great idea, but I wanted to go above and beyond. And so what I did was I am turning my clothing line and my jewelry line once it is manifested and I'm creating that and turning that name into a brand, which is named after my daughter, Christine Gabrielle. Um, I've gotten her name, I've copy written her name, and so I just felt like, wow, you know, what better way than to not only brand myself, but to brand my child in order to afford her an opportunity to live above and beyond her needs and not have to live, you know, like I did. So that is something that I'm very passionate about, something that I'm definitely working on and something that I'm not going to give up on. It's just really putting it all together with everything that I have going on. Okay, like I said, you're impressing me with every question I'm asking. I mean, I mean that is that is just so cool. I really like that. Now I need to I need to ask you this. Everything everything in life starts with a dream. Okay, please tell me at what well at what age did you start dreaming of all this? Not someone else's, but yours and yours alone, and it will get you far. 
Okay. Um, my next my next question is, you've been you 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 know you've been around in your career. You've met a lot of celebrities. You've done a lot. You've done a lot of positive things. How in the world do you stay humble? I stay humble by the grace of God. Um, I'm not even, I, I, a lot of people say, you know, don't say this, but I have to say this. I'm not supposed to be here. I feel that God has spared my life. And if it wasn't, if it wasn't for God and just me being, like, I don't get me wrong, I felt really wrong because I've gotten mad at God, like, oh my God, I just can't believe this is happening, what next, what next, what now? But just by the grace of God and, you know, the, the people that are my family, that I call my family, and that's, that's, that's it. Okay. Well, I just want to make this final statement for this segment and just say that you are a very empowered businesswoman and all around good person. And everybody, and everybody, and everybody that knows you know it, so you don't have to be embarrassed. But you're an all-around good person and a very empowered businesswoman. You're a good mother. You're you're just a good person, too. Well, I thank you. But I have to say this: not everybody will think that you're a good person, but you know, when you find out the hard road it took for her to get to her success. On my website, when you buy Late Murder at 10, get the sequel Garth from the Heart of a Virtual Demon for free. Buy the Sergeant Wise Guy Chronicles and get the sequel for free when it's released. The deal is offered online only and lasts until September. Go to the online store page for details. That's www.hdcampbell3.net. Russian nuclear warhead stolen in 1991 is discovered in Paris. The government asked the United States for help. They sent over their top strategist, codenamed Sergeant Wise Guy. Coupled with a smart mouth, can he work with the Parisian government in uncovering the plot before the warhead is used? Buy Sergeant Wise Guy Chronicles at your favorite bookstore or at these websites. Welcome back to my next segment of the Officers Corner, where we continue our conversation with Miss Delia McCutcheon. I know. I, my next, my, my next question for you is: I know with some success comes a long, hard struggle. You're a survivor of abuse who turns all around. All right, without without even getting into the abuse yet, I just want to know what kept you grounded as you move past that struggle. Now, I've been, I've also, uh, well, I also read in your bio that your career, pre your professional career started as an adult entertainer. First, how did you get introduced to that, and what exactly did you do? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I was about 14 or 15, 14 going on 15 years old, and, um, you know, I was, um, I was re not removed, but I removed myself from a horrible situation, um, being with my mother, and it started when my mother, you know, put me out of her house, and it's, it's a really long story, you actually have to read the book, but my mother put me out for the first time, and um, with that taste of freedom, I think that it just, it drove me to want to be free and, and just be just out there, and I want to say 
know, he woke me, and that turned into a really, really bad situation. Um, he took me to a, a strip club, and again, I was 15 years old, and here it is, you know, I'm not even knowing how old this guy is, he looks like he's young, but, you know, later finding out that he was older than 21, he had to be about 25 or 26 years old, and so I found out that this guy was a pimp, and, you know, it was the most horrible thing that I could have ever gone through, but luckily, and I, I, I'm grateful that God gave me the gift of gab and the knowledge and their understanding that I had a brain, and there was no way in hell that I was going to let anybody sell me for any type of money, and so that situation, um, it didn't last a very long time. I just remember running, just running away from this guy. And um, just that one taste of, you know, being in that scenery in the club and watching those women make money. And I'll never forget, there was this older lady in there, and she told me, she said, baby, you don't need to be here. You need to go home. But I didn't listen because I had come from an abusive home. I had come from, you know, my mother you know, uh, beating on me, and, and a lot of people, they go back and they watch the movie Precious, and they say, there is no way that a mother could have done that to her child. I'm a living testimony that it can happen, it does happen, and it still happens to this day, and I was a victim of it, and I allowed my circumstances to be turned around because of what I went through, so I was introduced to a world that most kids that age at 14, 15 years old, they're introduced to it. It's a way out, it masks the trials and the tribulations because you can be whatever it is that you want to be on that stage. And at 15 years old, I had to grow up. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are some pretty powerful words. You had to grow up, you had to grow up pretty fast for a lot of that. Now, go ahead. Yeah, I did. Now the next round of questions are going to be hard, so take your time, and if you're not comfortable answering, you don't have to, okay? Okay. Um, you were molested. Uh, what what age did the molestation start? Um, I do not, let me first start by saying that. You gotta have a problem talking about this. Um, I'm an open book. I write all of it in my autobiography. I was six years old when I was sexually molested by my sister's uncle, and it happened for three years. Um, it, it ended around the time that I was nine, and I confided in two young ladies at the time, which were my sisters, um, I want to say neighbors slash side sisters, and I begged them not to tell. And, you know, at that age, you know, I guess secrets weren't, you know, being kept, but it came out, and I told them what was going on, and I explained how it was going on and what he was doing to me. And um, it just came out, and it, and it spiraled into a whirlwind of chaos within my family. And what was that chaos? Well, what I what I would have wanted to happen, it didn't happen. Um, he was taken to jail. He was not indicted, nor was he convicted, because back then, in, in you know, at, in around that time. Um, DNA proof and all that stuff. It wasn't. It wasn't, you know, feasible back then. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I was never penetrated. But my my outlook on that is when a grown man touches a child in any way, shape, form, or fashion, when his bare genitals touch a young child, whether penetrated or not, that is molestation to me. And you know. I really don't think that my mother grasped what happened. Um, I still believe that my family was in denial, and, you know, it, it, it didn't happen the way that I would have wanted it to happen, just looking back on the situation. Um, of course, there was chaos, there was arguing, there was fussing, um, and then there came the, the reality check. It didn't happen. And I'm sitting, you know, she's looking like, what? Are you serious? Um, at this time, I'm probably 10, going on 11 years old, and I'm being told that this didn't happen. But it happened for three years, so I had to kind of take a step back and look at my family, my mother, and say, wow, why don't you believe me? And that's when 
What brought you the drugs? Turn around and write a book on how to please your man. You know, if you've been 
molested, why would you make a book or why would you write a, a synopsis or anything suggesting how to please a man? I think that they should turn that situation around and become a motivational speakers, become better women to help the next generation of women that are coming up behind us. It's nothing to feel sorry about. It's something to say there's triumph after the trials. You're right. I mean, you're very much so right. And basically, what this is what this form is to motivate others to know that you're not alone. You can always rise above your situation. I'm going to move on to my next question. Uh, your bio also mentions a lot of betrayals and near-death experiences. What were some of those? and 
example with y'all. We hate the name, but I have to create the B word. I have to create that person. I have to create that shell so that I could have this magnetic field around me that said, you're not going to touch me. But I still had to learn because it was a cycle that I kept repeating. And I kept allowing people to put their hands on me and beat me and strangle me and just go through all this stuff because they saw someone that was good-hearted, a good person, she's innocent, she's this, she's that, and they could control her, they could manipulate her, and they could hurt her. When we return, we'll come back with Daya McCutcheon's Path to Healing. From best-selling author Keisha Green, Buy her first book, and even if I did, for two ninety nine on Amazon Kindle. It's the story of three Jersey girls with different backgrounds, trying to survive in the real world while learning that life isn't terrible when you have friends. But as fast as things are good, they turn bad, which makes the girls come to the real definition of friends forever. Follow Simone, Taylor, and Jordan in this wonderful book, and even if I did, for two ninety nine on Amazon Kindle. And don't forget to join Keisha Green every Thursday on Blog Talk Radio for her Writer's Life Chat every Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. First, Michelle Nichols offered you a piece of herself in a piece of me. Then she teased you with a little sexual seduction. And now she's taking you on a road of emotions. Road of emotions. Coming soon to your favorite bookstore, or the website. Now, the conclusion of my very special interview with Miss Daya McCutcheon. There were people in my life that have never given up on me, and I'm still friends with them to this day, that have never given up on me and have always said, you're going to come out of it. It's going to be okay. And I would always say, when? When will it, you know, when will it all come together? And, you know, they would just always tell me, Daya, you're going to come out of it. it. It's not in, I would always hear them say, it's not in your time, it's in God's time. Not just saying God is taking too darn long. <laughs> See, that, see, that's wonderful. I mean, that, that is truly wonderful in the midst of so many negative people. There were some people pulling you along. Now, there were. There were. They are, they are my lifeboats. They are, you know, I still have my lifeboats and I can still jump on them and, you know, you know, smooth sailing, but you know, there are, there are definitely people that I have to say they are, they've always been there, they've never turned their back on me, and you know, I just, I've watched people, you know, um, from Twitter to Facebook to all the social networking sites, I mean, I've been every name in the book, I've been a liar, I've been a thief, I've been a backstabber, I've been all of that, but I just realized that those people at that time in my life, they were people that were for me. Whether, you know, they thought that they were or however they looked at it, they weren't there for me because a true friend, regardless to what you do, how you do it, or how you come about it, they're not going to condemn you. They're going to keep carrying you or they're going to keep holding your hand or they're going to keep walking beside you. And the people that I knew were my friends regardless were people that never talked about me, never talked bad about me, never went behind my back and said horrible things about my past or what I had gone through or never put it on the internet. They would always come to me and talk to me. And those people are people that I still hold dear to my heart because I love them. They love me. We're like sisters and brothers and sisters and, and so forth. So I can't knock the people who aren't here because I'm just happy that God removed them and allowed the people that are supposed to be here to be here. Okay. Very good. Now my next question is uh, kind of blunt, but what exactly sent you to prison? Being a criminal. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, you know, went from being in the entertainment industry to selling drugs, and you know, those were to me when I look back on what I went to prison for. Those were little misdemeanor crimes, although they, although they were felonies. But I went to prison for stealing people's identities, stealing money, you know, bank fraud, and, you know, um, credit card fraud, all of that, anything that I could make money from, I was doing it. And at the time, you know, I was I was dating someone, and they were, they had a bunch of money, and I, I wanted to 
be on their level. I didn't want his money. I wanted my own money. So I stepped inside of a world where white collar crime was the biggest thing going on. And I stepped into that world. Do I regret it? Absolutely. Because all the things that I've done to other people, stealing their identity, stealing their money, um, you know, just everything, it, it all came back to me, you know, and it, it all started happening recently. And I went to prison for wanting money, getting a lot of it. <laughs> and I mean a lot of it from having nice cars to big homes to, you know, everything possible known to a woman from her coast and all of that. I wanted all of that. So I stepped inside of that white collar world and I ran with it. But it, it was horrible just going inside of that world and, you know, stealing money and I'm talking twenty, thirty thousand a day, you know, just making money doing all types of stuff from the credit cards to the money the money, the fake money, to the credit cards, to the checks, to all of that being just a part of my life because I wanted to live in a world where I wanted to be someone that I wasn't. And I went to prison board. So why, so now why you were in prison? Who, I met, you mentioned in prison that a lot of people tried to help you. Uh, what kind of advice were you given? The advice that I was given was when you walk out of these doors, you don't do it again. Don't come back. You are so much better than this. You know, I was in there with women who were in prison for 20 years, 17 years. I'm still friends with a lot of these women that I was in, you know, that I was in, in prison with. You know, this was my second home. This was home away from home. And I had to, you know, create a family. And that's what I did. And the families that I created or the family that I claimed to, they were women who, you know, told me value. You are too young. You are too beautiful of a girl. You have so much in store for you. Why are you here? And I would just listen to the many stories while they were there from drug crimes to murder crimes to million dollar crimes, you know, trafficking crimes. with all kind of things that were going on around me that I was sitting here going, oh my God. And I, and I listened to all of these different stories and listening to what not to do, how not to come back. And what I needed to do to become a great woman. And it was, when you walk out of these prison doors, and you walk that catwalk, which was like a model catwalk, when you walk that walk, don't look back. And a lot of women that actually looked back went back. But I feel great that when I took that walk, I didn't turn around, I didn't say goodbye, I didn't wave at anybody or anything like that. When I took that walk, I promised myself that I would leave my alter ego, my crime, my abuse, my trials, my tribulations, I will leave it all on that catwalk when I left that prison. And listening to those women say, don't look back, don't walk back, and don't let her walk. And listening to them, and a humble woman walking out of those doors because I said, I'm not going to turn around and I'm not going to look back because this is a place that I never ever want to come back to. And it's been five years, and I thank God that I haven't been walked and I haven't been back. Alright, before I go to my next question, I'm going to tell you this, I'm going to tell you this off air, but I'm going to tell you this now. I don't want you to apologize for anything you have to say or get into. This is you telling your story, you can tell as raw and as real as you want it to. So don't apologize because you, you, you know, want to talk about, you know, how God has brought you through. God brings many people through. Say what's on your mind, okay? Okay. All right. My next question is, how long, well, actually, it's a two-part question. First, how long were you in prison, and what was the first thing you did when you got out? Whew. Um, I was in there um, a little over two years. I want to say two years. Um, and when I got out, I'll be very honest, I hit the ground running. I started doing illegal activity again because I wanted a car, I wanted an apartment, I wanted, you know, I wanted my life back. And reality set in when I almost got busted again. And all I remember was, if you get in trouble, I was in the halfway house, and I kept saying, if you get in trouble, 
you're going to go back to jail. But I didn't care because I wanted my world back. I wanted my life back. And I realized that God didn't want that for me because there were many days where he would hit me upside the head and I would almost go to jail. I would almost get caught. I would almost get in trouble. But he kept tapping me on my shoulder saying, this is not the life that I have for you. But I hit the ground running. I started doing illegal activity again. And by the grace of God, I got pregnant. And that reality set in. That here it is. I'm getting ready to bring a life into this world. And there's somebody that's going to meet me. And I've watched women in prison who had children, who had to sit across from their children and say, I'm not coming home anytime soon. And I didn't want that. My reality set in. When I got pregnant, and I got pregnant, I want to say the second, maybe between the first and third day I got out, I got pregnant. And I didn't believe it. I was like, no way. I'm not having a baby. But the whole time that I was pregnant, I was doing illegal activity. I was still a criminal. I was still living in this white collar world. Because I wanted the cars. I wanted the clothes, the furs, the dogs. I wanted to get things. But I wasn't going to get it. And so God had to give me something that would say, hold on, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a gift. Let me see what you're going to do with this gift. And I, I still didn't listen. I kept on and I kept on and I kept on doing the illegal activity. And reality set in once again when I got a call from an investigator saying, you need to pay back X amount of dollars or you're going to jail. Luckily, I had great friends that pulled together and pulled together a couple of thousands of dollars to keep me from going back to jail to repay what I was taking from society. Okay. Well, my next question, actually my next two questions talk about things you've done to um, get back into the fold. First, um, did you ever receive counseling for your abuse? Yes, I did. I actually received counseling in and out of prison. Um, I actually saw a um, psychologist, which was um, a part of the prison system. You went in and, you know, you had drug abuse on your, your criminal PSI, which is a report that, you know, the United States government puts together. They get together their probation officers and their psychologists, and you tell them about your life. Um, once they get a PSI report and you go to prison, um, they send you to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a therapist, and a counselor, and so forth. So I did receive counseling in and out of prison when I got out. Of course, everyone that goes through postpartum, so I was depressed. I hear you having a baby, and, you know, I'm living in an apartment with, you know, my daughter's father, and I wasn't happy. So um, my probation officer at the time said, hey, you know, there's a lady that's paid for by the government. So it's so, it's so crazy because the government spends all this money and we're in a recession. We're not going to get into that. But um, I did see someone, Dr. Deborah Lancaster, and she was amazing. She was great. Um, I could call her at the, in the middle of the night and say, I'm depressed, I'm crying, I'm going through something. And I'm not ashamed to say it because some, somewhere in our lives, we do need somebody that we need to talk to. We do need to, you know, get it off of our chest. And I'm just grateful that the government paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Well, I hear a lot of the stuff that I do, you know, hey, if you want to pay for me to see a psychiatrist, a psychologist, therapist, or counselor, I will see them all. I heard that. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I definitely heard that. Yes. So, you know what it helps me? It really helps me. A lot of people say you're crazy, you're thrown off, you're psycho, or whatever. But we all go through something, whether we're abused, molested, raped, beat up, battered, bruised. You know, we all need a, a let go. We all need someone that we can let it all go to, you know. And, and it's just, you, you either get a good person or you get someone that just wants to get paid. And luckily, I had someone that loved her job and, and loved what she did and loved helping people and taught me to create my own path and taught me that it's okay to cry, it's okay to get upset and you know, I'm having all these crazy thoughts, and, you know, I've, I've, I've been suicidal, you know, I've tried to commit suicide on several occasions, and I just realized that, oh, my God, God doesn't want me to go this way. And when talking to Ms. Deborah, it was so amazing because she would always tell me, you're not going to go out that way. You're going to leave a legacy. So stop trying, because if you tried all these times, it didn't work, guess what? It's not going to work the next six, seven times that you try. So... I escape that with trying to harm myself because I don't want to be here. But it, it does help when there are people that love their jobs and you think, I don't need help. I don't need to see a psychiatrist or a counselor or a therapist. 
me a call for couch. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's all I said. Uh, well, with all you've been through, you've turned it all around. Any specific steps you want to talk about you took to turn it all around? <laughs> well, you, well, you're continuing on, 
because of this, I've also read where outside of your current success, you're starting to work in a program where you're going to teach young women a better path. Tell me a little bit I'm about that program. On a program. I'm actually working on starting my nonprofit organization for young women who have been raped, molested, abused out on the street, um, who are living in circumstances that are beyond their means. Um, this is not a program that I'm working with. This is a program that will be my baby. This will be my new child. This will be my new project. This is something that I've always wanted to do as far as helping other women because I feel that that, that wasn't afforded to me. All the different, you know, um, counseling sessions in these different homes that they have. But people really don't care about you. They don't care whether you live or die. It's just a place that you can live or come and they get a check for you being there. So the, the nonprofit organization that I am working on and that I pray to God that I'm able to push forward with this is to bring young women out of abuse, abusive homes, out of bad situations, out of, you know, being raped and molested. I want to be able to be the go-to girl for that. And I don't want it to be some charity where people don't understand what's going on because a lot of celebrities get to charities not knowing what people are really going through. When someone gives my organization a charity or if they decide that they want to give to my foundation, I want them to understand that they're giving to a good cause, getting young girls off the street, getting them help that they need, providing them therapy, providing them psychologists and psychiatrists, and providing them treatment to help them get onto a better road of recovery to living the life that they really want to live. And that's what I'm working on. It's not something I'm working with or something I'm working with people on. This is my baby. This is my project. And this is something that I'm definitely going to see in the near future within that one year of what you actually what I plan on doing within a year. That is what I plan to have manifested within a year, to have something for young girls to be able to escape to, but a real reality of there is help, there is hope, and I'm going over the hump. And over the hump you are. So that, that actually that actually says where's my next question. So with all this positivity, have you thought about a legacy to leave your daughter? Because it's going to be a good one, whatever it is. Oh, I, you know what? If, I, if, if God willing, if I was to leave a legacy, I would definitely want to leave a legacy that is Really isn't a question. 
I'm going to give you the floor for any last words you want to say. For anyone who's going through this, you can talk about, you can talk about whatever's going on. You can promote something. Go ahead. On my website, when you buy Late Murder at 10, get the sequel Garth from the Heart of a Virtual Demon for free. Buy the Sergeant Wise Guy Chronicles and get the sequel for free when it's released. The deal is offered online only and lasts until September. Go to the online store page for details. That's www.hdcampbell3.net. Buy Late Murder at 10. Ex-investigative reporter turned audio engineer Mark Alexander was brought back into the business when the top news anchor at the station he works is tragically shot by a masked gunman and the co-anchor is arrested for engineering the murder, but Mark Alexander smells a classic frame-up. Now he has to face old friends and confront his demons to get the truth uncovered, but as each controversy gets uncovered, each turn could be Mark's last. By late murder at 10 at your favorite bookstore, or these websites. Normally this is the segment where I give you the technology corner where I give you the latest in technology but because of the nature of the interview today I decided not to do one. I do want to tell you about my next show. I'm going to continue my series on domestic violence and officers who struggle through it 
with my next show. It will be a very special show once again. And my authors will be Michelle Green and The One Essence. They both, they both are founder and co-founder of Safe Haven Publications. And you'll learn more about it, which is my next show. My technology corner will return the next show, but I'll be talking about how to use technology to stop the cycle of domestic violence and get help for those who need it. Thank you, and as always, let your writing fuel your spirit. Thank <laughs> you.